Iliad. We are going to do a read aloud. It's by Kingfisher Epics, The Iliad, retold by Nick McCarty. It's illustrated by Victor Ambrose. So here's our con table of contents. And this is our prologue. The prologue is introducing and getting us into the story. Now there's going to be some times that we're going to need to stop and we're going to look at how to pronounce the characters' names in our story. So we'll take a moment and we'll stop at that point when we have a new character to talk about. Okay, so ready to get started? Here we go. This is a story of interfering gods, brave warriors, and battles, a story of vengeance, heroic deeds, and the power of a beautiful woman, a story of blood on the ground below the vaulting towers of Troy and in the sand beside the curved crimson proud ships of Greece. It was a time when the gods took sides and meddled in the fate of mortals. The Greek have brought war to Troy and besieged the city for nine long years. Why have they come here in their thousands? Helen, more beautiful than the moon, has been stolen from her husband, Menelaus, king of Sparta, by Paris, prince of Troy. Led by their high king, Agamemnon, Agamemnon a cruel and greedy man, the Greeks fight to win Helen back. The Trojans refuse to let her return. Each side has its heroes, of course. The Greeks have Achilles, fiery, tempered, and a fierce fighter. Prince Hector, the Trojan champion, is a great warrior and more generous than his rival. The causes of their struggle began many years before. The story begins. Achilles' father, now let's look at that word. That one should be Peleus was immortal, and his mother was the sea goddess Thetis. Thetis knew that if she bathed her son in the waters of the river Styx, which mortals cross when they die, he would be safe from earthly harm. She took her baby, held him down, held him by his heel over the dark, raging waters and dipped him into the cold river. Was he protected? We shall see. At the time of our story, Achilles is grown man, run faster than the gazelle, and is a brave as a fighter, as an angry bear. Achilles of the bright armor leads more than 2,000 wolf wild warriors riding the wave path in 50 ships. They have come to the Trojan shores out of the southern seas around Greece for vengeance. So who is to blame for all of this? Paris would say it was nothing to do with him. He would refuse to accept the blame for stealing another man's wife. Paris could not resist the lovely Helen, nor she him. He would claim it was the work of the gods. Fate brought Helen to Troy, as fate brings the Greeks to rot in their huts and in their black prowed boats along our shore. You can't blame me, he'd say. The promise of Aphrodite is the promise of a god. I was bound to do as she foretold, but Paris was sometimes a petulant, selfish man. Was it his fault? We shall see. Okay, the meddling gods. I want you to look right here. So right here we have a picture of the mother, the sea goddess, holding her child. Now her child is Achilles. Now look how she's holding him. She's holding him by the heel. If you know uh, what you can connect this to, you can connect this to is that we have an Achilles heel. You can also co connect this to the constellations in the stars in the sky. That a lot of our myths 
are tied to some of the constellations that are up in the stars in the sky. Um, the meddling gods. Before his birth, it was foretold that Paris would be the ruin of Troy. His father, Priam. Oh, let's look. Is that Priam or Priam? I don't have that on my list. I actually think it's Priam. Before his birth, it was foretold that Paris would be the ruin of Troy. His father, Priam, king of Troy, ordered his herdsmen. Now that one is... Also another one, not on my pronunciation list, but if I'm looking at some of the other pronunciations of some of the other words, we're going to do the A-U-S as os, A-U-S as os, and we're going to do agalos, okay? So ordered his herdsmen, agalos, to kill the newborn baby, but the old man afraid of the gods, anger of if he did what Priam ordered, secretly brought the child up in the mountains. Only he and the gods knew Paris was the son of Priam. How did this young man herding long-horned cattle on the soft mountain slopes come to be promised, Helen, by a goddess? It hardly seems likely. But it's true, the goddess had interfered even before Paris was born. Invitations to the marriage of Thetis, mother of Achilles, to her mortal husband. Now let's look at that one. And we're going to go with Peleus. Had not included the goddess Eris. Eris was a troublemaker. She decided that the mischief she made would echo down through time. During the wedding celebrations, Eris threw a golden apple at the feet of the guests. On it were engraved the words, For the Fairest. Three of the guests, the goddesses Hera, Athene, and Aphrodite, were vain enough to claim the apple. Zeus knew what trouble there would be on Mount Olympus if he or one of the other gods were to decide who was the fairest. He ordered that the handsome Paris, a mortal, should choose. Okay, so here we go. We've got the, the girls all fighting over this apple. Okay, so he ordered that the handsome Paris, a mortal, should choose. Hermes, Zeus's messenger, found Paris herding cattle. The goddess stood with their faces covered. It was cold this high up in the mountain. Zeus orders you to choose who is the fairest, said Hermes. Now I'm thinking... Surely the guy can't have a, a really fair chance of being able to choose which one is the fairest or the prettiest of all because they've got their faces all covered. So I'm thinking, hmm, how's he going to do this? Is it on the prettiest hair? What, how's he going to, how's he going to figure this out? Zeus orders you to choose who is the fairest, said Hermes. I don't think so, said Paris, shaking his head. It's not my place to decide. I'd rather not. Paris knew that whatever he said would vex the losers. Then he smiled and took the golden apple. I'll divide it into three and give them each a piece. Paris, that won't do, Hermes insisted. Reluctantly, Paris walked up the slope toward the goddesses. Please, he begged. I didn't choose to do this. What can a man do when ordered by Zeus? Now, so Zeus is like the king of the, the, the gods. And if Zeus tells you to do something, you better do something. The goddesses turned toward him. Paris shielded his eyes from their blazing loveliness. One at a time, please. I am blinded by the three of you together. Hera was first. She came close and whispered, Give me the prize, and I will make you the lord of Asia and the richest man alive. Paris said nothing. He looked away. Athene was next. She stood looking him directly in the eye as 
high over the dark crags an eagle soared as into the endless blue sky. If I win, I will bring you victory in all of your battles. I'll make you the wisest and most handsome man in the world. Paris shrugged. I don't need to do win battles. I'm a herdsman. I don't need bribes to make fair judgment. Now is Aphrodite ready? Aphrodite stood in on the soft green grass. The mild summer wind whispered around her. She leaned closer to the youth. Paris, a man as handsome as you, won't waste his life on these mountains. You will marry Helen of Sparta, who is almost as beautiful as I am. Helen, daughter of Zeus and as lovely as a swan, is yours. Aphrodite shamelessly moved closer to the trembling young man. Go to Sparta, Paris, and she will fall head over heels in love with you, I swear. Without hesitation, the young man gave the golden apple to Aphrodite. Heron Athene would not forget the insult Paris had never meant to offer them, and so it began. So now you hear that do-do-do with the author. You see that? Hera and Athene would not forget the insult Paris had never meant to offer them. And so it began. Every year, King Priam held games in memory of the son he had condemned to die on the mountains. He would send a request to Agalos, his chief herdsman, to bring a magnificent bull to be given as a prize at the games. One fateful year, not knowing he was Priam's lost son, Paris decided to follow the bull into the city. Agalos begged him not to go, but the youth was determined to compete in the games. He competed in boxing and won, and in the foot race and won, beating the king's sons, Hector. Now we've got another hard to pronounce word and we're going to have to go for it. I think this is going to be Diaphobus. They challenged him to run again. Paris won his third laurel wreath. So he's winning all of the Olympics. I want you to think about that as we connect that. Hector and his brother, furious at being beaten by a common herdsman, threatened him with their swords to save the unarmed Paris Agalos confessed that he had not obeyed the king's orders to kill the baby. So Paris was happily reunited with King Priam, his father, and made peace with his brothers. Now a Trojan prince, Paris never forgot the promise Aphrodite made to him on the mountain slopes. One day, his, he asked his father if he could lead a Trojan delegation to the Greek city of Sparta. When King Menelaus ruled with Helen, his wife, the gods smiled and watched their mischief unfold. Paris found himself the honored guest of Menelaus in Sparta, a white-walled city in a barren part of Greece. So look at this picture. He was treated with great hospitality. He repaid it dishonorably. Helen was everything that Aphrodite had described when Paris awarded her the golden apple. Paris could not resist her. He gave Helen gifts, whispered honeyed words, drank from the goblet she had drunk from, and she was equally attracted to this handsome young man. They walked together through the palace, sat in the shaded courtyard, touched hands as if by accident, and gazed at each other. The court was alive with whispers and rumors. King Menelaus, a decent man, would not believe the gossip. He saw how, how Paris never left his wife's side, but thought it was only a young man's folly. He even left them together when he sailed to Crete for his grandfather's funeral. Helen must stay to entertain their Trojan guest. That same night, Helen shamelessly left Sparta with Paris and sailed for Troy. It was done. And what came next followed as night follows day. 
thousand ships sail for Troy. All of Troy fell under the spell of Helen's beauty. Paris bowed. She would never be returned to Menelaus. Only Hector, a brave and honorable prince, was wary of Helen and her dangerous beauty, as was his wife, Andromache. Now let's look at that word. That's also, here we go. It's Andromache. Andrew Mackey, okay? So we're right here, right around here with Andrew Mackey, okay? A wise and noble woman. Now I want you to look at this. Anytime the author gives you a comma after a difficult word, we're filling in some blanks there as far as giving us clue about those words, okay? So we're going to look. Only Hector, a brave and honorable prince, was weary of Helen and her dangerous beauty, as was his wife, Andrew Mackey, a wise and noble woman. So Andrew Mackey is the wife to Hector, and they're weary of Helen and her dangerous beauty. Menelaus demanded that his, his brother, the high king Agamemnon, help him retrieve his wife. Agamemnon agreed, as was his duty. So the Greeks came. They came from, now let's look at how we're going to pronounce this word. We're going to go Cephasis, okay, Cephasis. They came from Cephasis and sacred, I've got a pronunciation sheet, but some of these words are not on here. I think this is Chrysa. Ajax brought 12 ships from Salamis and moored them in Aulis where the Athenian army camped. Men came from Cyprus, the land of doves, and others were led by a son of Hercules. Still, the Greek ships came, Menelaus came from Sparta with 60 ships to fight under his brother Agamemnon. The high king brought the largest force from Corinth and Let's look at this word. I think this is Mycenae. Let's look. The A-E together in these words, it's not on my list. Okay, I'm going to go on. We'll have to come back to this. I think it's Mycenae. And still they came. From Pylos and from Crete came men led by Idomeneus, the spearman from Halkadiki, Mantinia, and Ancias. High proud, bright painted ships swooped across the waves carrying well-armed Greeks. Odysseus left the island of Ithaca, a place of pine forests in soft blue seas with 12 crimson proud ships, he left his faithful wife. Penelope, in the hopes of battle, loot and glory. Warlike Diomedes came to prove his bravery. He brought 80 black sailed ships from vine covered Epidaurus. Nestor, Though an old man came to offer wise counsel with a crew of warriors eager for the clash of bronze and on bronze, and the mighty hero Achilles came with fifty open ships, each carrying fifty warriors eager to fight. So they came swan proud, open boats crashing through the deep green sea and over the sparkling dawn waves. They drove on until nightfall and then sailed atop the lifting swell. They rode like carrion birds swooping the swelling waters together close to the black cliffs and foaming spray. The gods sitting on Olympus watched these ships gathered like gulls over a skull of silver fish. Zeus father of the gods. So remember I told you he was like the king of the gods, like the big ruler. He's the father of all the gods, father of the gods, 
Hera, his wife, Athene, the goddess of war, Poseidon of the earth shaker, Aphrodite, the goddess of love, and Eris, the troublemaker, looked down on the Greek armies and their favorite warriors. Now, do you see what the author did here? So the author is giving you all the players here of all the gods, okay, and who they all are. So we've got Zeus, the father of the god, Hera is his wife, Athene, the goddess of war, Poseidon, the earth shaker, Aphrodite, the goddess of love, and Eris, the troublemaker, look down on the Greek armies and their favorite warriors. So it's like they've got a different point of view that they're watching all of this unfold. <coughs> the fleet had gathered, now the fleet being all those ships gathered, gathered in a safe haven in Aulis to regroup before they reached Troy. There they saw an omen. So they see something that's about to unfold. They were making a sacrifice when suddenly a snake with blood red markings as fast as a whip emerged from beneath an altar, heading straight for a plain tree. A brood of fledgling sparrows sat on its top branch. The mother fluttered nearby as the snake ate the nine little birds. The snake coiled up, struck again, and took the mother bird, eating her too. The warriors wanted to know what this meant. And the calcus, the seer, spoke. Zeus has sent a message. We will fight for Troy's high towers and her wide streets for nine years. One year for each of the fledglings in the tenth year. We will fight in the streets, towers, and and the walls will be ours. In the bright morning, they sailed for Troy in battle. So they took that whole thing that played out with the snake and the, the birds as a sign of what they would do for their battle. So they're not planning on something really fast. They're planning on being in it for the long haul. Okay, we're going to stop right there, and we're going to pick up the Siege of Troy next. Okay, have a great day and enjoy reading.